Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alicio and I'm the Youth and Young Adults Pastor at Mortel Oatley Baptist Church. And uh, I'm really sorry that I can't be there in, in person, uh, but obviously because of COVID, I have to record this at my home church. But I am excited that I get to uh, preach to you once again. And uh, today we're going to study God's Word and we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 and also Matthew 28. Uh, but before we do, let's pray and ask God for a humble heart as we study His Word. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, that we can uh, connect with you. Thank you that we have Scripture. Thank you that we have um, evidence and, and stories about Jesus. And, the, and today we are going to see how discipleship works and what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to follow the mission? And I pray that for us today that we may just evaluate our lives and think about what we do. Are we passionate for the gospel? Are we passionate for the mission? Or are we still being selfish? In Jesus' name, amen. It's probably pretty obvious, but over the last 18 months, two years, um, a lot of businesses and companies have been hit hard because of the coronavirus. Uh, a lot of companies and a lot of businesses have kind of had to adjust their workplace. Things that they never thought they would be doing, they're doing now. So, for example, uh, a lot of businesses and companies, uh, they've told their employees, hey, you've got to work remotely. You've got to work from home. Some companies I know have uh, moved offices because they're saying, well, you know what? We're changing. We're not going to be in a big building anymore. Everyone's going to be working from home. And they're doing that to cut costs. Uh, a lot of company, companies and even us here at MOBC are doing online meetings, something that we never thought we would be doing, but that's just the way it is. But it's interesting because even though a lot of companies are surviving and changing and all this because of the pandemic, the companies that are surviving or thriving are doing it for a reason. They've changed a lot of things, but they haven't changed their mission or vision. Why? Because great companies know that even though a lot of things will change, they're never going to abandon their mission and vision for the company. The company's mission and vision is what defines the existence of that organization. The mission statement tells people why they exist. The mission statement is the heartbeat, the soul of that company. Now, let me give you some examples of what I mean. Three companies I'm going to talk to you about or I'm going to um, share with you in regards to their mission statement. Maybe you've heard of them before. The first one is Amazon. I, I'm an Amazon user and I'm loving it. But this is interesting what their mission statement says. To be Earth's most customer-centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online and endeavors to offer its customers the lowest possible price. That is their mission. That is, that is why they exist. Microsoft, a big tech company, this is their mission statement. To enable people and businesses throughout the world to realize their full potential. Lastly, Coca-Cola. To refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happiness, to create value and make a difference. All these companies have gone through COVID or are going through COVID and this pandemic, yet these companies have adapted some things over the last couple of years, but they haven't changed their mission. Amazon is still making sure that customers are buying off them and getting the lowest price. Microsoft is still enabling people to realize their full potential. And Coca-Cola is still giving people diabetes. Oh, sorry. I mean, Coca-Cola is still inspiring moments of happiness. Now, you may think, well, why is Alicia talking about this? Well, today, I would remind you of your mission. If you call yourself a believer, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you have a mission. And that mission is to make disciples. Now, you may be saying, okay, what, what do you mean by that? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to look at the life of Jesus very briefly, very quickly. We're going to look at how it started, how Jesus did discipleship, and what it meant when he left for heaven. Now, 
Before we go into Mark chapter 1, let me just explain a couple of things. If you didn't know, Jesus actually started his ministry when he was 30 years of age. Okay, so before the age of 30, we don't have too much information, but I'm sure he lived a normal life. But once he reached the age of 30, that's where he began his ministry. That's where he started to fulfill his calling from God. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 16 and 20, this is where we see Jesus starting his public ministry in Galilee. We see that his goal or his mission was to tell others the good news, was to tell others that the Messiah, the Savior, has arrived. Now, just a bit of a heads up, that Messiah is him. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Savior. Jesus has arrived from heaven to die, to pay the price, and to reconnect us with God. So that was the goal. That was the mission of Jesus. Yet Jesus knew he couldn't do it alone. He couldn't go around Israel by himself to do this. So what did Jesus do? He chose chose 12 men to disciple, to mentor, to empower, and to ingrain the mission. Let's read from chapter 1, verse, sorry, Mark chapter 1, verse 16 to 20. And this is what it says. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Let me point out a couple of things about this passage. The first thing we see is that Jesus chose two brothers, and their occupation was fishing. They were fishermen, and he chose them to become his disciples. Now, I'm not sure about you, but that is a massive statement. If you wanted to start, say, for example, a church or, you know, church plants, uh, most likely you probably want people around you who have a bit of experience, uh, maybe you know, have gone to Bible college, had a bit of training, a bit of maturity, or at least qualified to be in ministry. And that's what you think Jesus would have done. If he wants to spread the good news, he surely would have gone to people who are pretty good, you know, best of the best to spread the word. But he didn't do that. Jesus did the total opposite. He chose fishermen. That wasn't a fantastic job back then. Uh, These guys were most likely quite young and inexperienced. But what really struck me is that they were unqualified. They didn't pass that religious educational system where if they did, if they were as good as they could be, just like Paul, they would already be with another rabbi learning. But they weren't. They went back to their jobs, fishermen, that's what they did. But Jesus said, no, 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 I'm going to offer you something. And just referring to last week's sermon from our special guest, we we know that Jesus qualifies the unqualified. And that's what we see here. Jesus offers these, these men an opportunity, an opportunity to be discipled. What does he say in verse 17? Follow me and be my disciple." It was an invitation to learn, to grow, to be trained by Jesus himself. And that's what discipleship is. Yet Jesus was also asking them that they had to pay a price. Jesus was calling them to a whole new life. They had to leave their family, their occupation. They had to leave their identity of being a fisherman. They had to learn a new way of living. They had to become a student. And now... They had to understand what the mission was, what the mission was going to be. That was to be to make disciples. This is the theme. Jesus called them out, say, follow me, but Jesus also committed to them. He taught them how to share the good news. He got alongside them. He lived life with them. He connected with them. He ministered to them so they can do the same thing with others. It wasn't all just knowledge. It was a mixture of knowledge, but also a hands-on experience. Jesus led these disciples to become spiritually mature so that when Jesus leaves, they would make more disciples. Jesus was training them 
ingraining this mentality of being a disciple who makes disciples. So if we fast track three years, like I said, this was going to be very brief. If we fast track three years, we get to the final events before Jesus ascends to heaven. Jump to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Very cliche passage in regard to discipleship. But let's go through it and understand what's happening here. So three years have passed. Jesus has died, he's, he's risen, he now has full authority throughout heaven and earth, given to him by God the Father. And this is what Jesus says to his friends, to his disciples, to those who have been faithful to him. This is what he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See what Jesus did? He reminds them of the mission. He says to them, look, I've done my job. It's your turn now. Take over what I have started. Remember the mission. Go, tell others about me, baptize them, teach them, show them, be with them, encourage them, empower them. Reach the, um, reach the lost. Go make disciples. Teach them more on how to be more like me. That is discipleship. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Alicia, I, I've, I've heard this all before. You know, every year, maybe May Missions Month, maybe we have a missionary. It's the same thing over and over again. And you know what? You are absolutely right. If you've been in the church circle long enough, you probably know this passage. You probably know Matthew 28. You probably have it in your house somewhere on a little plaque or something or highlight in your Bible. But let me say this. Are you doing it? Are you making disciples? Because for some Christians, it's all knowledge, but no action. Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, I have four kids, and uh, for those who know, um, who have kids, they know how tough it is to get um, their kids to clean up. Maybe it's pack away the shoes or the clothes or, or whatever it is. You know, as a parent, you might have to remind them two, three, four, ten times. You know, parents, you're, you're nodding right now. I want you to imagine that you're, you're with your, your child and you see that their room is, is totally messy and you go to their room, you say, hey, can you clean up your mess? And your child goes to you, yeah, yeah, sure, mom, dad, no, no worries, I'll, um, I'll clean it up. You walk away, uh, you, you're hoping, you're, you're thinking that your child has listened to you. You come back and you realize that the room is, is, is exactly the same. They haven't cleaned up everything. But you notice that your child is grinning and he's happy and, and, and he comes to you and says, mom, mom dad, I've, I've got good news. Like, okay, well, what is it? I've memorized your statements. You said, go clean your room. I, I, I know it. Now, as a parent, you'll be like, right? like, who cares if you memorize it? But then your child says this, Mom, Dad, not only have I memorized it in English, I've memorized it in Greek. How good is that? Now, as a parent, you'll be like, I don't care if you do it in Greek or Spanish or Japanese. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you listen and you obey. Now, that's such a stupid story, but I'm using that analogy because sometimes as Christians, we are like that. We know what to do. Some of us have even gone to Bible college or been church around long enough. It's all head knowledge, but we don't put it into practice. We don't make it priority. And that's not what Jesus has called us to do. So today, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, don't be that person. Don't be that follower of Christ who knows everything but doesn't do anything. If you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you need to evaluate your life. You need to look at yourself and say, well, am I really putting God first? Am I really making disciples who make disciples? 
God hasn't called us into the Christian faith just so we can go to church or youth group or, or small groups and tick off things. That's not what Christ has called us. He's called us to make disciples who make disciples. You're probably listening to this on, on a Sunday, uh, the 10th of October. Tomorrow, Monday, the 11th, is Freedom Day. Now, if you don't know, a bit of context here. Uh, Sydney has been in lockdown for uh, about four months now. So there's lots of restrictions, a lot of things we can't do. But tomorrow is Freedom Day. Tomorrow, uh, there'll still be some restrictions, but a lot of restrictions have been eased. So we're really excited. We get to go back to normal, socialize, mingle. We get to go to the parks and pubs and restaurants, cinemas, all that stuff. We get to mix in or talk to our family. We can have family over, which is great. I think this sermon is, is perfect timing for what's about to happen. Because from tomorrow, we're going to go back to our normal lives. We're going to go back to socializing, playing sports, doing all the things that we love. But something I want you to think about is saying, okay, I'm going to go back to how things were. Well, it won't be exactly the same, but how things were. But if you're a believer, I want you to ask this question. How can I ingrain this mission, this mission of discipleship, this mission of telling others about Jesus into my life? How can I make disciples who make disciples? Am I prepared to tell others about Jesus? Am I prepared to live life with others? Even if they don't agree with me, live life with them, journey with them, so that one day they may know the truth. Now you may be saying, well, hang on, Alicia. This is, this is way too hard. You're, you're, you're calling me to discipleship and I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if this is possible. It's a bit too hard. I don't know where to start. That's okay. It's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be fearful. What I would recommend you to do is start basically saying, okay, well, maybe I should pray about this. Pray that God will give me the strength and the courage. Maybe you can go to someone who's in your church who's a little bit senior. Maybe you can go to your senior pastor and say, hey, I really have or I really am struggling with discipleship. Could you please disciple, disciple me, mentor me, help me? Because I want to tell others about Jesus. Because if you say, oh, everything's too hard, sweep it under the, under the rug and become complacent, that's where we live a life where all we do is tick boxes. Go to church, attend growth group, maybe pray once a week. All this will make God happy. But that's not what God has called us to do. The Christian faith is not about ticking boxes. It's about making disciples who make disciples. So let me encourage you to evaluate your faith, to evaluate your life. Like I said before, we, tomorrow, freedom day. We're going to go slowly. We're going to go back to our communities, our schools, our workplace, our universities. We're going to see our friends and our families and our co-workers. But let me say this. These people don't need another religious person, right? They don't need someone else who's just religious. They need a disciple. They need someone who loves Jesus. They need someone who wants to disciple and make disciples. At the beginning of my sermon, I spoke about how great companies never abandon the mission and vision statement. They stick to their guns, they know what their mission is, and they've got to focus on that. Maybe things will change around them, but they, they're going to stick to their mission statement. For Jesus, for followers of Jesus, for you, this mission statement of disciples who make disciples is 2,000 years old. But it's true. We need to remember it. We know it works. We know we are called to do it. Are you prepared to make disciples? Sometimes when we, when we listen to this, we think, well, look, that's great. But really, I think you know, discipleship making is maybe for missionaries, for pastors, uh, for the elite Christian. But that's not right. Jesus calls everyone to make disciples disciples. Yet, I understand that it might be a little bit hard because you're saying, well, Lisa, your context is a little bit different. You get, pay, get paid to do discipleship, and that is true. But I've had um, some conversations with people, these people I really look up to, because what they do, how they live, 
is a really good example of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to disciple others to live out your faith, either at home or at the workplace, with family, um, or even with the church community. So please enjoy these two interviews. For me, it means being a follower of Jesus, somebody who um, has accepted Jesus as their saviour and, and wants to follow them in the way that he has asked us to. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, I guess for me, it's really following Christ and uh, placing Jesus, I guess, at the front and centre of everything in my life. Well, that's where I thought I would be a bit, I was at a bit of a loss because I don't, I don't think of it as discipling uh, the things that I do. I think uh, that, well, I know that that goes back to when I was young and I've, I've thought about how I did it when I was a young person and I think I was a bit of a Bible basher because I thought that's what you had to do and I wasn't very good at that and I wondered why I started to notice that people, you know, didn't want to get into those conversations um, and so I guess I just stopped and I went to work and lots of other things, you know, get in, in the way and as a young person it was like oh we don't let on that you're a Christian because they won't like you so it probably wasn't till I left work and I was a bit older and I um, got involved in voluntary things with my children when they were little and it sort of became my way of life and I I probably what I do as far as discipling is concerned is um, people who, women who are younger Christian women, um, it, I like to get alongside them and help them in their walk, only if they want to. With community, the community ministries, um, and particularly with mainly music, um, I've, I've just found it's important to be who you are and make friends. And I think God leads you to the people that he has already got at a point maybe. Um, we we did a, a sermon series, I think you may or may not have been with us some years back, and we talked about being the links in the chain and I found that quite liberating because the hangover from my youth days was almost like you get them and you've got to convert them and, and it's a big pressure that I just... I kept thinking, well, I'm a failure at that. And, um, yeah, so reminding myself that, you know, I may start a friendship and I may not get a person to a certain point. What happens is I generally just um, make friends with people and be me, and I think it's important that we show um, who we are as a Christian. We haven't got three heads and we don't wear different hats. And Do you know what I mean? We're all normal. We're all certainly flawed. Um, and I think it's important for the women that I've become um, good friends with, particularly women from the community, um, I think it, I've just shown them who I am. And, you know, when there's an opportunity and, and sometimes I'll be talking or listening to what their problem is and I'll be thinking, praying in my head, you know, give me the right words, Lord. Um, but it's not like I'm going out with the Bible under my arm. It's not like that. It might be a two-hour cup of coffee where somebody's just pouring their heart out and I can say, well, because I'm a Christian, this is how I cope with that situation. So you can constantly be bringing it in. Greg and I have a lot of, of non-Christian friends or friendship groups and they all know that we're Christians, we go to church, they rarely put something on a Sunday before midday because they know that we would generally say, look, you know, we won't come, we'll come late. Um, and we kind of appreciate that. And we found over the years that, um, and I still, I find it always in conversation, people are curious. So they will ask you. We, we often, we had just before... Uh, lockdown we had lunch with friends and um, 
one of them wanted to know about, tell us about the guy that climbed the tree. Greg and I looked at each other and, I mean, he, he clicked in quite quickly. But that's the sort of thing that people, you know, I had another friend, um, I had a girlfriend whose daughter died during COVID and she was only in her 30s and she's left a young family. Another friend who has slipped away, um, she said to me, when this is all over, this COVID, you and I have to talk about faith. I need to know what's kept you going. Again, I thought it's interesting. It's just interesting if you don't, I don't go looking for it. It's kind of like it comes to me. And then, you know, I'm just aware that when that happens, I think, well, God's put that person in my life at this point in time. I need to say something. And that doesn't have to be a scriptural verse. <laughs> for me, being a disciple of Jesus, it's really living an integrated life and by that I mean it's not really living a life where you're sort of compartmentalized where there's that sacred secular divide or a Sunday Monday divide it's being Christ-centered in in all facets of, of my life so you know we we all have 24 hours in a day right uh, which equates to about 168 hours in a week so Let's just say, you know, well, I think I could get about eight hours of sleep a day, which is about 56 hours a week. So that's about, you know, 33% of my time where I'm actually sleeping. So which means I've got about 67% of time where I'm actually awake. And let's say, you know, let's say we're, we're you know, at church and stuff like that. So I spend about what, two hours at church each week, probably, you know, an hour and a bit, you know, at a growth group. Um, then say 30 minutes each day in daily devotion and, and prayer. And if I don't sort of place, you know, my focus on Christ outside of these times, it would mean that I'm a disciple of, a disciple of Christ for about, what, 5% of my week. Um, but what, you know, what the Bible, you know, it reminds me of his in 1 Corinthians 10 31 and it says, you know, whether, you know, I eat or I drink and whatever I do, basically, I do it all for the glory of God. So that means, I guess, it's a hundred percent of my life is a disciple of Christ, one that follows. And I think, you know, the, the church vision really sums it up well with regards to, you know, leaning, learning, loving, living and leading, I guess, a hundred percent, you know, of my life in, in those areas. So I think like as parents, you know, we um, obviously, you know, we do desire for our kids, you know, obviously to be happy and healthy, do well in their school and all that, all that good stuff. But I guess being a disciple of Christ, what Joe and I really pray for our kids is to, to grow, to be men of Christ, to be fearing, to be seeking and to be loving God all the days of their lives. And, that, you know, in this world, there will, you know, be trouble, there'll be challenges that they'll face throughout their lives. Um, but, you know, to to let them know that we have an awesome and, and, and powerful God who is with us, and this God that we have has overcome the world. Um, yeah, and as a professional as well, you know, the workplace is a place where I spend, you know, a great deal of my time. Um, you know, and God's the one who created and sustains this world, and he's also God of the workplace. So in whatever I do, you know, even in work, um, I seek to do it for his glory. So when I approach work, um, you know, a focus of mine is to strive for excellence um, and strive for excellence so that whether, you know, the outputs of the outcomes that I produce or even my attitude as I go towards, you know, Know, um, how I approach my work, it's to glorify him so that, you know, I can reflect Christ's character in, in the way that I go about my work. Um, I've also been fortunate to, um, you know, be part of in-house Christian groups where I've worked and we've gathered together to pray and read the word together. And it's been really encouraging to, because, you know, through the working week, um, you know, seek to be a group of disciples that gather together to stir one another up, you know, in love, 
in good for good works and encouraging each other throughout the work week. And um, I guess, yeah, given that, you know, I spend so much time in the workplace, um, there's loads of people that I've, you know, whether I've previously or currently am working with that, you know, I've been able to develop a relationship with. And I do see my workplace or wherever God has placed me to be a mission field uh, where I'm able to, uh, one, you know, as I get to know people better and make myself known to them as, as a Christian, it's, um, it's opened up opportunities to talk about, you know, faith matters and also about the gospel uh, with the people. And I see that as just such a wonderful opportunity um, as people, you know, um, talk about, you know, what did you do over the weekend type of things, those becoming opportunities to share about my faith as well. Um, I don't have anyone formal, but there are Christian women who I know I can go to. Jeanette Reitmar is, is a good encourager and she has good, really good Bible knowledge that she can help me with. Um, Deb Arkapoor is another one who, and I think we're good for each other because she will sometimes come to me. And I think generally women are, are good at that because we are good networkers and we know who we, who we um, uh, what's the word? You know when metal sharpens metal, that sort of thing. My growth group ladies are, are probably, you know, they're just so special. Carol is just the wisest woman and Fran's always been in my life since I started at the church and Pam. You know, I worked with Pam in the Sunday school. They're women that they understand me, they get me. So I know when I, you know, I've and I've had the odd occasion recently, I just know even just being with them, even just when we have a prayer time together, I always feel invigorated and I feel that they've they've filled that gap. That it's hard with discipling because I I, I don't I don't personally think it has to be a formal thing where you say well, we're going to meet every Tuesday at two o'clock and I, I think a, as a Christian community particularly community of women um, it's being available for each other and not everybody connects with everybody else but I think you have to work out I mean I've got a little little group of younger women that I just keep an eye on and I think as you get to know each other, I mean, I can sometimes pick straight away when one of them's struggling with something, but it, it's being aware, just being mindful of, of your Christian sisters. All right, welcome back. Uh, hopefully those interviews were encouraging. I did them on purpose because even though I can share some stories with you, I think it's more powerful when you hear just a normal lay person and their stories and the way they disciple and the way they love Jesus. I think that's really, really powerful. So to wrap up, I'm going to repeat this again. I've been repeating it all sermon. Are you committed to the mission? If you're a believer, are you committed in making disciples? I'm not asking if you're committed to church or if you're committed you know, to a growth group or youth group or whatever. I'm not asking you that. Are you committed in making disciples? Because true disciples make disciples. Now, you might be sitting there watching this and maybe you're not a believer, and that's okay. My question to you is, do you believe or do you think that Jesus is real enough for you to commit your life? Just like the fishermen, where Jesus calls them out, but doesn't say, but there's other passages where Jesus tells people, hey, hey, if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you everything. That is the same thing here. I'm asking you, are you ready to commit your life to Jesus? I know sometimes we make following Jesus quite simple. All you have to do is go to church, put your hand up, maybe make a simple prayer. But it's more than that. It's your whole life. It's your identity. It's your mission. Everything changes. Are you prepared to follow Jesus at whatever cost? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you that we have Scripture and we can see how you made disciples. Thank you that you trained and empowered and showed these people what it means to be a disciple. And then when you left, when you went back to your throne, you empowered them to spread the word. And from 12, they went to 24, 24 to 48. And they just kept on multiplying. And now today, we have millions of believers. But there are millions, if not billions, more people who don't know you. And I pray, I pray that we may continue on to share your word, to make disciples, because that is our mission. What is ours in the name of Jesus? Amen.